Turn it on. Okay. Um, so today we have a really, really special program. Um, as you know, members over 50 in action have been very active in planning really interesting and informative programs. And I've been going through my phone book looking for every person I know, seeing like who owes me any favors or favors I could do for them. And like Joel was really easy. I mean, all he wanted was this like N95 mask. Like he's like, if you give me a mask, I'll speak. I was like, okay, you got it. So, um, so I really want to thank you, Joel. I mean, Joel, as you know, is, I think is your title senior attorney at the district attorney's office? Um, I don't know. Senior trial counsel. He's, he's important. Okay. He's a big person at the ADA's office. And I really want to thank you so much, Joel, for, for doing this. And he's going to, I'm going to point, Put this over to Joel now um, and let him introduce himself a little bit and tell you a little bit about what he's going to be talking about today. Well, first of all, I can say that the last time I spoke at Hebrew Institute was in November of 2017, and I thought that after that speech, I'd never be invited back. Uh, it, one of the things that was funny about it was in discussing the underbelly of society, some of the stories were figuratively and literally below the belt. And as a result of that, some people were amused, some people were offended. I think, Rabbi Martyr, I hope you're on because I remember your famous Rabbi Martyr eye roll, which I greatly enjoyed. So I was jealous, I wish I could do it. <laughs> so uh, I, I think Judy felt with, with Zoom, people can leave by just clicking a button. They don't have to run out in the middle. So she felt uh, really reassured by that. My view was, is as to muting, I don't care, Judy, if you mute the people or don't mute the people. I think that the people should be allowed to boo, to cheer, but not to yell, honey, can you get me a cup of coffee from the kitchen? That I would not, uh, you know, that would not be cool for me. Okay, so everyone can unmute themselves if they'd like, and you can definitely uh, get involved in this process. So I, I decided, uh, I was inspired by Rabbi Martyr's uh, three minutes of daily dose of Torah. So before I get to the main show, I decided that I was going to give uh, a little religious viewpoint myself, having no knowledge. So in light of Rabbi Martyr's three minutes daily dosage of Torah, I had proposed three minutes daily dosage of davening. I just sort of thought that it would be cool if we had three minutes of davening, we'd start with one Birkor HaShachar, one Baruch Shamar, Yishtabach, Shema truncated, and finish in three minutes. And my view was God hates sycophants, and God is watching more what you do than what you say. So I guess that is not gonna be a big success, but that's my uh, religious viewpoint of the day. And now let's get to the Aster case. I can say, honestly, uh, let me just see if I can get this going. Uh, How can you, everybody hear and see? Yep. Yes, we can hear yeah. and see. Yeah, so Fairy this is a story about a person I had never heard of. Brooke Russell Astor, if you're who actually lived to 105. And who, who knows who's singing this song? Frank Sinatra. Who's singing this song? Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. 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 Absolutely correct. So there I was, an assistant DA who had dealt with violent crime my whole career, and I was asked to work on a case involving somebody I had never heard of. Uh, when I heard the name Brooke Russell Astor, I, I thought it was odd for me, an ethnic Jew, Aster was not a name on my radar. I really thought she was named after a subway stop. <laughs> I had heard, I would learn that she went to the Knickerbocker Club and I thought she was a basketball fan. 
And there she would eat grav lox. And I thought it was like lox with a schmear. I had no clue who she was, nor the high society life that she traveled in. And I would come to learn and to enter a world that I never entered, I could never understand, but that I had to make sense of in order to be able to prosecute a case. See, I had to learn how does one become chairman of the board of the Metropolitan Museum of Opera? How does one have dinner parties where the guests are the Kissingers, Oscar de la Renta, Kofi and Nan Anand, Barbara Walters, Peter Jennings? What is it to wake up in a 6,000 square foot apartment on Park Avenue, ring a bell and have breakfast in bed? How is it, and it sounds weird, that you have a social secretary such that if your grandchildren want to visit you, they have to ring, uh, they have to call the social secretary to make an appointment. And sort of how is it that a person, that people who are Americans end up sounding like they're out of masterpiece theater? Uh, one of the things that I learned was that Brooke Astor had a $300,000 casket. What does a $300,000 casket have that a pine casket doesn't have? I thought maybe Bose speakers, flat screen TV. It was just a crazy world. So let me ask the audience now, do you, do you know of a a, uh, do you know of a hotel that's associated with Astor? The Waldorf? The Waldorf Astoria. Waldorf? You're muted. Are, it, it, the Pierre. Is somebody yeah, giving an answer? Astoria. Waldorf? I think you're muted, Daniel. I think you yeah. should spell it out and put the no, sign in front said, because he said you're the muted and can't sit and can't hear you. The Waldorf Astoria. It turns out that the hotel associated with Astra was Waldorf Astoria. Does anybody here know of a tragedy in 1912 that involved an Astor? The Titanic. John Jacob Astor the great grandson of the original Astor, who was the furrier, was on the Titanic. His wife was pregnant. The joke goes that he was sitting at the bar when the Titanic hit the iceberg, and he said to the guy behind the bar, I asked for ice, but this is ridiculous. He did not get on the lifeboat because they were taking women first, and he died when the, uh, in the Titanic. He, there was no lifeboat for him. So this was a family of wealth, a family that had money in New York. And Brooke Russell Astor was not an Astor. She married into the Astor family. Uh, I'm gonna play for you a little bit of how Brooke Astor sounded when she spoke. This was a speech that she gave uh, at the age of 95. This is a most delicious evening for me. I could attend my very highest dreams. I never would think of myself being the only woman with all these wonderful, attractive men around me. It means a lot to me. And I've, I've always felt, I used to bother say, my mother used to say to me, Brooke, don't get beyond yourself. But I feel today I've gotten very much beyond myself. So there it was, she was speaking to a group of men, including David Rockefeller and the rest, who were admitting her to an all men's club, the Knickerbocker Club. She was 95 at the time. One of the in interesting facets of it was her ability to speak publicly at a point where she was in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's. And it was interesting because one of the things, there are certain social aspects that are not affected by Alzheimer's, that people can be fooled, that you can carry on a conversation. She was giving a speech that she had given a hundred times, and uh, that's how Brooke Astor spoke. 
So Brooke Astor was really quite an interesting person in terms of how she ended up. How she lived to 105. She was the only daughter of the 16th Marine Commandant in the United States. And her father was stationed in China and Brooke spent much of her childhood in China. She loved Asian culture and in later years, when she became a philanthropist, she gave a lot of money to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Eastern Wing was donated by her and in fact, they imported wood from China and brought workmen from China to replicate a village in China. She sent her chef to Chinatown to get food to cook for the workmen. And she, they were also stationed in the Dominican Republic in Haiti. Brooke Astor's mother pushed her to marry young and to marry rich. So she had what you'd call yichus from the fact that her father was the head of the Marines, but did not have gelt. And at the age of 17, she married John Dryden Couser, whose grandfather was a senator from New Jersey. At one point, she had attended the Madera School. Does anybody, had anybody ever heard of the Madera School? I did. Private school in Virginia. Does that ring a bell? Yes, the person who killed the well, doctor. The headmistress of the Madera School was one Jean Harris who killed the diet doctor. Right. So she was a person who was traveling in the upper crust of society, but without the money. She ends up marrying John Dryden Couser in 1919 at the ripe old age of 17. And while he had yichus and money, he was a violent domestic abuser. He was a lout, a drunk. And according to the writer Francis Kiernan, he broke her jaw. She became pregnant with her first and only child who would later become the defendant uh, Anthony Couser. Anthony Couser eventually became Anthony Marshall. Uh, Brooke Astor divorced John Dryden Couser at the age of 22. So she was married for five years and she's divorced in 1924 at a point where there was probably public shame for people who got divorced. In 1932, she met Buddy Marshall who was an investment firm guy who was related to James Lennox, the founder of the Lennox Museum. And they were married for 20 years and she really loved him. 19, she, she was financially secure, but not Richie Rich. She was working for magazines. She was a writer. And in 1952, Buddy Marshall died of a heart attack. Now, Brooke Astor, at that point is 50 years old. Her son is in his 20s. He took on the name Marshall because he liked him. And she feels distraught at his death. Buddy Marshall himself was divorced, so she did not inherit much money from him. And she was very worried about her financial future. This is a picture of Brooke Astor when she was young. And uh, she was one of these people, even in, into the 80s and 90s, that ate salads and was uh, incredibly physically fed and slim. And she was really very worried about what would happen to her. Enter Vincent Astor. Vincent Astor at that point was a uh, married to somebody named Manette Cushing, and Manette Cushing wanted a divorce, and Vincent Astor said, I'm not going to give you a divorce unless you find me another wife. At first, Vincent Astor wanted to marry this very rich, pretty woman, and he was trying to convince the pretty woman's mother to allow him to take this woman's hand in marriage, and he said to the pretty woman's mother, let your daughter marry me. My doctors only have say I only have five years to live, to which the woman quipped, what if your doctors are wrong? That's how much Vincent Astor was liked. He was a strange uh, profile. He had this foundation, which he said was to alleviate human suffering. Yet 
people found him to be a misanthrope. People hated him. He didn't have friends. Brooke Astor is introduced to him and she marries him. And this is his third wife. And as a misanthrope, not only didn't he allow friends, Brooke's friends, to become part of their lives, he didn't like Tony Marshall, the son. And he says, if he comes here, I'm throwing you out. So there, Brooke is married to a man who's cut off any contact with her only son. The marriage to Vincent Astor reminds me of the old Jewish joke. Somebody's admiring Mrs. Minsky's diamond ring and, say, and they say, what a beautiful diamond ring. And another person says, well, that comes with the Minsky curse. What's the Minsky curse? Minsky. Well, Brooke Astor's marriage came with the Minsky curse and the Minsky curse was Vincent Astor. Now, Vincent Astor died in 1960. He had no children. He left property to her, real property to her, and his estate was about $120 million in 1960. It was probably one of the richest people in the world. 60 million of which was placed in a charitable foundation, and Brooke was named to be the head of that charitable foundation, the Vincent Astor Foundation, as, as it says on the screen, to alleviate human suffering. And 60 million was in trust for, for Brooke Astor. She was going to live off the income from that 60 million. And when she died, that 60 million too would have to be given to a charity of her, cho uh, of her choice. So there it was, Brooke Astor, the daughter of the 16th Marine Commandant, became a very rich person at, at the age of 58, unmarried, with one son, Tony Marshall. And there were those who would say that she was a gold digger, that she married Vincent Astor for the money. But Brooke Astor did something amazing. Although she was nominally, at least in name, supposed to be the head of the Vincent Astor Foundation, the men on the board said, Brooke, Go take a cruise, we'll take care of this. We don't need you. Brooke was a feminist in the truest sense of the word, not in the Jane Fonda bra burning sense, but rather that she was gonna do a job in that foundation that no man could do. And from 1960 to 1997, she basically reinvented herself from gold digger, to the Grand Dame, Grand Dame of New York. And it wasn't so much the money in the foundation, there were bigger foundations, but over that 37 years, Brooke Astor gave $200 million to various charities. And the charities that received money from the Vincent Astor Foundation would then receive money from other foundations. When Brooke Astor found it, gave the seal of approval to any of the charities that she gave, it immediately flooded in money from other sources. So the museum, the, the, the charities were big and small, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the New York Public Library, the Bronx Zoo, Museum of National History. But then there were smaller things like the Eldridge Street Synagogue, various homeless entities, she was on the board of directors of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the New York Public Library. And in this period of time when the charity gave 192 million, she herself gave seven or eight million of her, her, her own money to charity. This is the picture of Linda Gillies, who was her executive director with Brooke Astor in the office. And Linda Gillies told a very sweet story because part of Brooke Astor's charm was that she would not give to any charity without really going out to the field and seeing what it was about. So if she wanted to donate money to a basketball court in Harlem, she was at that basketball court in Harlem. And she would dress with a hat and she'd have her white gloves on and then she'd talk to the people and then she would give. So she was this public persona of charity. She wasn't just writing checks. So Linda Gillies tells the story of Brooke going out to uh, get some low-income housing, some apartments for poor people in Forest Hills, actually where I grew up. 
and they go into an apartment which they were going to give to charity and Brooke says to Linda Gillies what's missing from this apartment and Linda says well, it looks like a nice apartment I don't see anything that's missing and Brooke says what's missing is furniture you don't give somebody an apartment without furniture from that Brooke started an organization called furnish the homeless where she hit up furniture manufacturers for donations to help not only giving somebody an apartment, but giving them the furniture, the bedding, the cabinets, so they could live properly. And you, ha you see here a, 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 an incredible sensitivity, which sometimes I can say quite frankly, did not, did not fall into the aspect of how she treated her son. Her public persona, she was golden in terms of her media coverage. Uh, always dressed to the nines and always talking to the people on the site, whether it's a kid playing basketball. And as a result of this, over this 37 year period of time, Brooke not only became the Grand Dame of New York, but she became so accepted by high society as somebody that everybody wanted to know that she got, people like this wanted to get to meet her. So who, who is in this picture? There's an obvious one, and there are a couple less obvious. Who can guess? Kofi Annan. Henry Kissinger. Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan, and I don't know who that is. Hmm. Looks like David Annan. Rockefeller. Anybody guess who's in this picture? Rockefeller. Well, obviously, we oh, have. Yes. Yeah, uh, David Rockefeller. Henry, Henry Kissinger. Kissinger, right? And who's, who's the Kofi other? Annan. Hmm. Kofi Annan. Oh, the next. Uh, Judy, that looks back. like <laughs> That's um, Annette Lorenzo. It was Henry Kissinger, Kofi Annan, and David, David Rockefeller. Rockefeller. Right. In this picture, we have Annette De Laurenta right. with Brooke Astor. So here's a person who incredibly reinvented herself, not only as a rich person, one of the richest people in the world, but one of the biggest humanitarians. And Kissinger told me the story that when he was leaving the White House and he was gonna to move to New York, he called Brooke Astor, invited her to the White House to get to know her. So he and Nancy Kissinger were trying to get themselves into the inner circle to be invited to her famous dinner parties at 778 Park Avenue, where they'd have six power couples, the Jennings, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Michael Douglas, uh, Kofi Annan. So there it was that she had a life which was really a full life in terms of charity. She had three husbands. The way she described them was the love of her life, Buddy Marshall. She was very kind to Vincent Astor and said that he was nice, though most people didn't think he was. And then there was John Dryden Couser, who she said was horrible. So you have here, the trial that I was involved in was a trial against her only son and his lawyer, a fellow named Francis Morrissey. So here, her only son was born to John Dryden Couser a couple of years after she got married at the young age of 17. And uh, here he is. This is the picture of him as he looked at the trial. He certainly has uh, movie star looks, but the relationship was an incredibly weird one. Now, those of us who have grown up on the show, Leave it to Beaver, or any of these TV shows where the family life has these trivial problems, knows that families, relationships and families never look as good as, uh, on the outside they may look normal and in the inside you see the dysfunction. This was clearly a highly dysfunctional one. He was raised with nannies, he wasn't a good student, at the age of 16 or 17, he lied about his age and he enlisted in the Marines. You know, his grandfather was the head of the Marines and he got wounded at Imo Jima and he got a purple heart for Imo Jima. And he worked for the CIA 
And after the CIA, he was the ambassador to Madagascar, Trinidad and Tobago, Kenya. And in the late 70s, when he returned from foreign service, he managed his mother's money. And she was paying him $250,000 a year salary. She bought him an apartment, a chauffeur. She paid the maintenance in the apartment. So she was generous. But he was a guy who, in, I don't know if it's in Hebrew or Yiddish, you'd say, lo yutzlach, not successful. In fact, the story was told by somebody at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the general counsel, Ashton Hawkins. Brooke Astor described how he got all these ambassadorships. She went out to a party for Walter Annenberg when Nixon, after Nixon had resigned, it was the first party that Richard Nixon had shown up at. And she sees Richard Nixon. And at that point, Tony Marshall had been ambassador under the Nixon administration. She went over to him and she said, Mr. President, I want to thank you so much for giving my son the honor to work for you. And Nixon said, thank you, and walked away. And Brooke Astor turned to Ashton Hawkins and said, those ambassadorships cost me $100,000 to the Republican Party. So you had a situation where the money, she had to shell out money to get this guy jobs. The relationship was an odd relationship. She was certainly proud of the fact that he was an Iwo Jima war hero. She gave him the six figure salary as the business manager, an apartment, a chauffeur. And he had a durable power of attorney, which means the power of attorney, which isn't capable of being revoked, even if the person becomes incompetent. He could do with her property what he wanted to, so long as it was in her interest. And the thing that was odd about her was that she was always insulting him to everybody, to friends of hers, to maids. She'd say, oh, Tony, he's boring. She had friends, somebody who had been knighted, a guy named Sir Joseph Hotang from Hong Kong. When he would come in and he'd say, who do you want to, she'd say, who do you want to invite to the dinner party? He'd say, what about your son? She'd say, oh, Tony's boring. She also would say about Tony, he's all about the money. He never made anything for himself. It was best put by the author of the book, Mrs. Astor Regrets, who said about their relationship, she loves him, but she doesn't like him. And that was truly, uh, the thing about the money, that he was into the money was a little bit ironic since she herself had married Vincent Astor for money. But the fact that he was boring appears to be something that you're accusing somebody of something that he can't help. It's not that he wanted to be boring and it, it, it was a tad cruel and it does put the, the case in a certain light that she didn't treat him well and that at some, in some sense, the crimes that arose arose out of the fact that he felt entitled, that he felt mistreated by his mother and he felt that he was entitled to take. This is the cruelest line that she said to a cousin about Tony Marshall when they at the cousin said, why didn't you have more kids, Brooke? And she said, he was so unfortunate I decided not to have any more. So there it is. She reached 100 in 2002 and she so disliked him and his second wife, Charlene Marshall, that she was, there's Charlene and Tony, uh, the daughter-in-law, that she did not want to be escorted to the party by either of them, but rather chose a cousin of Vincent's, Lord Astor from England to escort her to her own party. And you see here, uh, there's another picture of Charlene Marshall and. You know, the press does things. Is Charlene Marshall entirely evil? No. Was Brooke Astor entirely righteous? No. But you'd believe that from the way the press, and it wasn't only the Post, it was the Times as well. But Mrs. Astor detested the daughter-in-law. And much of what Tony Marshall did was because he was afraid that he was going to die and he was not going to outlive his mother and Brooke Astor had set up estate planning, which said that if he dies, Charlene Marshall gets nothing. So here you have a picture of Lord Astor at Brooke Astor's 100th birthday, escorting her to the birthday party. So why was it that Brooke Astor hated Charlene Marshall? Well, Brooke Astor had a home in Maine called Coven. It was a summer home in Northeast Harbor, Maine. 
and she attended a church, St. Mary's by the Sea, at the point that Tony Marshall, her son, met Charlene, Charlene was the wife of the vicar of the church that she attended, St. Mary's by the Sea. Charlene had young children and Charlene would walk back and forth in front of Brooke Astor's house, hitting on Tony. He's in his mid sixties, she's in her mid forties. She's not only married to the minister of Brooke's church, but that she has young children. So Tony and Charlene leave Maine to go to New York and they move in together. So she basically has an affair with Brooke Astor's, for this crowd, I'll say Brooke Astor's rabbi's wife and leaves her children. And Mrs. Astor was mortified. It's her church, her minister. She hated Charlene Marshall with a passion. The best she could say about Charlene Marshall was, Charlene makes Tony happy. And uh, they got married, Tony and Charlene got married in 1992. And to show you how little Brooke thought of Charlene, she would give jewelry to Annette De La Renta, Oscar De La Renta's wife, who didn't need any jewelry. Just, she says, I don't want Charlene to have this, take this $50,000 piece of jewelry. Or she left Charlene a mink stole that given Charlene's size and Brooke's size was a mink stole that would fit on Charlene's wrist, but not around her, her neck. There were insults like that. So you have this situation where Tony is married to somebody who Brooke hates, and it affects the way that she does her estate planning. She doesn't, she doesn't want this Charlene to get a plucked nickel. And there were nasty stories back and forth. Brooke breaks her hip and Charlene and Tony are about to go on vacation to Europe. They show up at the hospital and Charlene says to Tony, your mother wrecked our vacation. You know, the chutzpah of Brooke not to have good timing and when she broke her hip. So you have Tony and Charlene, Tony getting some money from Brooke if he outlived Brooke, but if he died before, Charlene would be cut out. And enter into this, what I would call the Bialystok and Bloom uh, lawyer. Who knows the term Bialystok and Bloom from a movie? From the producers. From the Bialystok and Bloom, anybody know that? Yeah, from the producers. Bialystok and Bloom. I guess everybody's muted, but the name of the movie is The Producers, and it was with Zero Mostel, and basically Zero Mostel was courting older women to get them to invest in a play that was gonna crap out and, and, and go bust. So, uh, that was the lawyer who Tony Marshall befriended and he was a lawyer who had been suspended. He was accused of stealing. And what he would do is he'd befriend older women and get them to become the beneficiary. So you have a guy who's a con man by nature. He's such a con man that in the middle of the trial, when he heard that my wife was going to Israel, he saw me in the bathroom and he tried to befriend me. Here it is, I'm trying to put him in jail and he's trying to become my friend. We're standing in the bathroom there and he says, I know your wife's going to Israel and wasn't Jewish, you know, obviously an Irish guy. And he says, if she goes to the Western Wall, please have her say a prayer for me. And he was charming. And I said to his lawyer, Puccio, I know he's a con man. If I'm about to give my wallet to Francis Morrissey, please don't let me do it. So let me explain to you what the charges were, how the case came about. This was basically a case where Tony Marshall, Charlene, who was never charged, and Francis Morrissey sought to loot her estate, which was worth about $180 million. So Brooke Astor had been represented by Sullivan and Cromwell, White Shoe Waspy Firm, for 
over 50 years. And her will in 2002 was very simple. There was the trust, which she was administering. Everything was going to go to charity named by Brooke. That was about 60 million. There was 60 million in real property. Tony Marshall was going to get her three houses. She had one in Briarcliff Manor. The apartment, the 6,000 foot square foot apartment on uh, Park Avenue in Coven, Maine. But he would have to pay the, the state taxes and the expenses of sale, which would be millions of dollars. And there was a residuary. The residuary, he would get 7% income for life, and then he would name the charities that would get it. That's what it was. In terms of the value of it, the greater value was the real property. So he was basically going to get something like $23 million in real property, and then he would get this life interest, which he could live off of. Now, the thing about this was that Brooke so hated Charlene Marshall that if Anthony Marshall predeceased Brooke, which wasn't something which was out of the question, he had had a heart attack, he was only 20, uh, 20 years younger than her, and she lived to 105. If he died, before Brooke, everything would go to charity. The entire estate would go to charity, except I guess for that mink stole and a couple of gifts to Charlene. Charlene would get nothing. So the premise of the case was that there were all these, all these changes in the will designed to benefit Charlene. How did this come about and how was it discovered? Of all things, it was discovered by Tony Marshall's twin sons, who were adults, with whom he didn't have a great relationship. And they visited Brooke Astor, and they began to notice, Brooke had these two dogs, Boise and Girlsy, that the dogs were relieving themselves all over the apartment, that there were no longer fresh flowers in the apartment. And they got the sense that Tony Marshall was not taking good care of Brooke. He was being cheap with her. And they were so upset that they went to John, John Rockefeller and they said, we think that he, my grandmother needs a guardian. And Rockefeller and Kissinger made an application before the court to get a guardian appointed. And the result was that when the guardian was appointed and they started peeling away at looking at wills and at financial transactions, they saw basically that Tony Marshall and Francis Morrissey were trying to loot the estate, to steal the, everything from the estate, to change the will, to leave everything or near, uh, much of the estate to the son, Tony Marshall, and then to Charlene. And then there were these common uh, aspects of, uh, of stealing. So one of them was, was that there were paintings stolen off the wall, each worth about $250,000. And he couldn't say, Tony Marshall couldn't say that these were gifts because he hadn't filed the gift tax return. So she'd be sleeping in the day room out of it and Tony would climb over her and remove, remove a, uh, a drawing from the wall which was worth $250,000. He had a power of attorney and the power of attorney gave him the capacity to give himself a raise. He gave himself a million dollar a year raise. He bought a yacht and he hired a yachtsman who was paid for by Brooke Astor also. He used her employees to do his work. He was uh, producing Broadway plays. He got her through their joint lawyer to give the house in Maine to him. And then he deeded it to Charlene. And then he renovated it to the tune of $700,000 and the renovations were paid for by Brooke Astor. Now you have White Shoe, Waspy Firm, Sullivan and Cromwell representing Brooke Astor for 50 years. And they also represented Tony Marshall as well. And there's a big issue of a conflict of interest because it is wise in family planning for those people who have money, not me included, that if there's a family lawyer, that family lawyer can plan multi-generation bequests. But in this case, there was a simple conflict. And the conflict was 
Brooke Astor wanted to leave much of her money to charity, and Tony Marshall wanted to leave much of that charity money to him and to his wife, Charlene. And the lawyer from Sullivan and Cromwell, knowing that Tony had the power of attorney, also knew that Tony could fire him as Brooke Astor's lawyer. So Tony Marshall would go to Terry Christensen, the Sullivan lawyer, and say, I need more money. I want you to go to mother and get mother, get Brooke to give us the house outright in Maine. There was a cottage in that house that Brooke Astor had spoken of giving to the grandchild. Terry Christensen in 2003 goes and gets Brooke Astor to give the house in Maine. He doesn't want to get fired. Same thing with Tony Marshall says that my, my wife doesn't have enough money to live with. So in August 2003, at Tony Marshall's request, Terry Christensen, the Sullivan and Cromwell lawyer goes to Brooke and says, Get, give $5 million to Tony and Charlene. So you have the lawyer for Brooke Astor, who Brooke Astor trusts, doing this at the behest of the son, who's basically taking money which would otherwise go to charity. In December of 2003, a, a, an amendment to a will is called a codicil. It's a fancy word. Tony Marshall wanted the yichus of giving out charity. And according to the will of 2002, the, 50, the 60 million in the Vincent Astor Foundation was to be given by Brooke Astor's choice. Tony Marshall wanted him to have the right to give out that money. So he put, started putting pressure on the lawyer, Terry Christensen, to allow him to give the money. So Terry Christensen, facing a lot of pressure from Tony Marshall went to Brooke Astor in December of 2003 and got a change to the will which said that Brooke Astor could give out 51% of the charity and Tony Marshall 49%. Now if you see here, Terry Christensen in December of 2003 knows that he shouldn't be doing this because Brooke Astor is senile. She has Alzheimer's. She can't make these decisions anymore. He writes this to an associate in December of 2003. Tony and I spoke at length on Friday and he twisted my arm to increase the allocations. I refused to go above 49%. I've tried to state with a modest degree of style what she is doing consistent with her lifetime actions. Well, guess what? Brooke Astor is alive in 2003. He doesn't have to do consistent with her lifetime actions. What he's admitting is that she was incapable of making these decisions because she was senile and that he had no right to do it. So why did he do it? He did it because Tony Marshall could fire him and he would lose the whole account. And the big payoff for law firms is not so much the daily work, but the administration at death of a $180 million estate. So he goes and he has her execute this codicil and you see, this is the sort of stuff that Tony Marshall had Terry Christensen do. He, he got this painting for two, he got a commission for selling this chilled Hassan painting. He takes a commission from his mother, a $2 million commission. I think it was called Flags on Fifth Avenue. He got the house in Maine, five and a half million dollar house. And then he got $5 million in cash, all at points where Brooke Astor could not make intelligent decisions because she was suffering from latter stage Alzheimer's. Here are the two twins, Philip and Alec, and those were the ones who really brought this to the fore. Had they not gone to John Rockefeller, Tony Marshall, Francis Morrissey would have gotten away with it. So here we have, uh, the indictment and the indictment charged a bunch of things. One was the grand larceny scheme to defraud, stealing property from her at a point in her life where she couldn't make these decisions. Uh, there was a third codicil and the third codicil basically said that all the expenses of the sale of the property would be taken from the charity saving, uh, Tony Marshall, $4 million in expenses, estate expenses, estate taxes. 
It was the theft of the paintings, the theft by rays, all of this stuff was part of, uh, part of the charges that they faced. Now, one of the things that was interesting was here are Brooks' aides, and it's always good to be nice to what I call the little people. I'm little, be nice to me. But the little people in Brooks' world were the people who took care of her, the chauffeur, the nurses. Tony Marshall and Charlene Marshall were dismissive of these people, and these people took diaries, and those diaries screwed Tony and Charlene royally. So what is it that you need to be able to execute a will or a change to the will? You have to be 18 years or older. Of course she was, you know, she died at 105. Of sound mind, which she wasn't, and memory. You have to have memory. And the mental competence required is a very minimal standard. It's what they call the moment of, you need a moment of lucidity. And why is it such a low standard? low threshold, it's lower than to make a contract. And the witnesses who, who watch this execution must just say that the person executing this change had this moment of lucidity, of clarity of mind. The theory is, is that you should be able to leave your property to whomever you want. It encourages you to accumulate it for family members to be loyal to you. So in essence, the question that this jury faced was, at least with regard to leaving the whole residuary to Tony instead of charity, what did Brooke Astor understand? Did she understand what was going on in December 2003 when she signed the codicil, giving Tony the right to play with the charity money? Did she understand the codicil in 2004 when it left the entire residuary to him? Did she know the nature and extent of her property? In other words, if you don't know that you're worth $180 million, and that's what she was worth, then you are not competent to make any changes. Did she know the identity of natural objects of her bounty? Did she know who her friends were and who her family members were? Did she know how the property was being disposed of? If you can't identify your friends and family, you can't change your will. If you can't know how much money you have, you can't change a will. So uh, basically what happens is Marshall is putting pressure, and this is a picture of Brooke Astor with her British butler, Chris Ely. She had 23 employees. Marshall's putting pressure on Terry Christensen, the Sullivan lawyer, to change things. And Christensen is bowing to the demands in detriment to Brooke Astor's interests because he knows what Brooke Astor wants, having represented her for so many years. What could he have done? He could have said, I'm resigning. I'm not doing this. Get another lawyer. Uh, he could have asked for somebody to appoint a guardian for her. Instead, he towed the line, but he pushed back a little. He, he only gave Marshall 49% control over the charity, but still he didn't abide by the notion that somebody who's in her mental state and physical state shouldn't be doing any changes. And in fact, uh, here you have something about Brooke Astor, which was very well known, that she was very nice to people she met, even if they weren't important people other than her son. This guy, Chris Griftos, was the florist at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. She sent him gifts, get well cards. She confided in him. She'd say, oh, my son is only into the money. He only was waiting for the money. This is uh, the nurse, Perlene Noble, and she referred, Perlene Noble referred to Tony as golden boy, and she took copious notes. Every time there was a change to a will, she was writing a diary, and it was those diaries that sunk Marshall and Morrissey. After the three codicils, after the changes, the Vincent Astor Trust, Tony could dispose of 49% of it. He got all the real property, and you'll note that on the chart, it was the Vincent Astor Trust who paid all the expenses, the commissions and expenses, so the charity lost millions by the change. 
the residuary, which was supposed to go to charity, like the Metropolitan Museum, was now going to Tony Marshall. And if Tony Marshall died before Brooke Astor, all of it would go to Tony's estate, which really meant Charlene Marshall. So you have a division of the estate. Before, in the 2002 will, if Marshall, uh, if Marshall did not, if he predeceased her, he got zero. After the changes, he got 53 million. So the changes were incredible changes that screwed charity, charity and only helped Tony and Charlene. Now, one of the things you have to ask always in, the jury had to decide, was this consistent with what the pattern that Brooke Astor had in the past prior to her Alzheimer's? She never allowed Tony to be the sole executor. He never had an authority to appoint a successor to him. He was never given the residuary estate. He always had to pay estate taxes to the real estate. He always had to pay expenses of sale of real estate. She was saying through the will that she didn't think much of him and these a sea change of a 360 degree change in what she wanted to do seemed like it was out and out thievery. So there it was, we were facing a case and on the left side of the, this uh, slide, you see the, the weaknesses of the case. This is an 85 year old defendant. I could tell you that he had two medical incidents in the course of the trial. One where he fell in the bathroom at 100 Center Street and they took him out, there was blood and all that and he was an Iwo Jima war hero, the only son, and people could say, well, she has the right to leave all her money to her only son. He had a durable power of attorney. Now, the durable power of attorney allows you to do anything with the property, but it has to be in the interest of Brooke Astor and not you. And he was her only real heir. She gave him money and property in the past. Those were the weaknesses, the strengths. 1995, well before any of these changes occur, Jesse Jackson comes to the office to pitch for money and she doesn't recognize him. Henry Kissinger in 2000, he was a witness at the trial. He's invited to a dinner party at Brooke Astor's house. The guest of honor is Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan is sitting to Brooke Astor's left, Henry Kissinger to her right. The party is for Kofi Annan. There are maybe eight, eight or 10 couples. Brooke Astor turns to Henry Kissinger in 2000 and says, who is this black man who's sitting to my left, Henry? And Kissinger goes, Brooke, it's the secretary general. She had no clue who the guest of honor was. And incidentally, in her will in 2002, there was a bequest of 1% to some UN agency in honor of Kofi Annan she did not know who Kofi Annan was in 2000. In 2001, Barbara Walters comes to visit Brooke Astor and she gives her a pill box as a gift. A half hour afterwards, before Barbara Walters leaves, Brooke picks up the pill box and says, oh, Barbara, I want you to have this gift. She had no idea, she had no memory of having been given this gift. How can she give away property if she doesn't even know who she got it from? And of course, I spoke about the pattern of wills on the other page. And then there was a letter that Tony Marshall wrote, a gerontologist, in which he said that Brooke was senile. At that point, we think he was trying to be appointed guardian and to steal by being appointed guardian. And he went through all of the reasons why he thought she was senile. And then in 2008, during the trial, he would have to say that she wasn't senile, that she had good days and bad days. But it all amounted to the little people, the diaries, these killer diaries showing that at the time that these changes were made, she was totally out of it. Here's Barbara Walters and the gift of the pillbox. And here, these are doctor's notes. She had a doctor from New York Hospital. The date of this is June 3rd, 1997. Telephone call with Tony Marshall, more and more confused. How many times have you been married? She doesn't know how many times her son has been married. Who is the mother of your children? She forgot Tony's birthday. 
And then there was this little blurb, Tony fears what she says to others and lawyers. Doesn't sound too good what his concern is. Not Tony fears that his mother has this illness for which there's no cure, it's he's worried about what she says to others and lawyers. This is November 2003. This is prior, prior to the big changes to December. Doctor's notes from Dr. Pritchett, New York Hospital, confused, brings up brother Dryden. Dryden was her husband, not her brother. She refers to Dryden as Vincent's brother. Total, total confusion. She then, it says, fears being killed, but accepts this. And then it says, son, money. A little bit unclear, but certainly not a person who's competent to give away $60 million when some lawyer shows up. She had been given an exam, a mini mental status exam. Simple thing. She's given three words, animal, dog, table. Say them after me. That she could do. She's asked the three words after 30 seconds, animal, dog, table, cannot remember those three words after 30 seconds. She fails this mini mental status exam. The grade is a failing grade consistent with moderate Alzheimer's. And this is in December, 2001. And Alzheimer's is a progressively worse disease. It didn't get better in 2003 and 2004. And here is a brilliant test that was designed as a screen for Alzheimer's. And that is, it's the clock test. You've been drawing a clock for 70 years of your life. Can you draw a clock if you have Alzheimer's? The answer generally is no. You don't have executive function. You can't plan. So here was Brooke Astor, I think it was in 2000, her first stab, she could draw the face of the clock, but you see it's poorly done. And then she screws up the later test, which shows she's supposed to do nine o'clock and it's certainly a, a, a totally messed up clock. You see a year later, she's doing worse. She's incapable of doing the things that she had done for 70 years, a screening test for Alzheimer's. And then it came down to these killer, killer, killer diaries by nurses, by chauffeurs, by people who were incredibly nice to Brooke Astor and who were incredibly demeaned and treated poorly by Tony and Charlene. So you have here, this is August 2003, when Tony Marshall gets the lawyer, Terry Christensen, to give $5 million to Brooke Astor, uh, from Brooke Astor to him and Charlene. And this is one o'clock, came down, refused to get dressed in street clothing, alert and oriented times two, very frightful in times, and has periods of confusion and disorientation, not sure that this is her home. Two hours later, the lawyer visits for over an hour. Do you really believe it's fair to ask somebody to give away $5 million of their guilt at a point where she doesn't even know that it's her house? And these are the notes, the killer notes of the little people that change things. This was the codicil or the change to the will that gave Tony Marshall 49% of the charity. And this is what was written in the nurse's notes on that day. She wasn't sure about her itinerary. She was disoriented to time and place. She wanted to know who was taking her to the nursing home or else she would die. I reassured her that this wasn't her time. Her time will be a surprise. It shows the Rachmanis shown by Perlene Noble, a really saint of a person, to somebody she was working with. But it also shows what business did Terry Christensen, white shoe, waspy firm lawyer, have to have her execute a change to a will, giving her son control over 30 or $40 million for charity at a point where she has no clue, she's disoriented to time and place. And Terry Christensen himself in doing this codicil knew that he shouldn't do the codicil. And it's, he wrote in the codicil, on top of the codicil, first and final codicil. Well, guess what? There's no such thing as a final codicil. The first codicil is a first change only until there's a second change. He wrote final codicil because he wanted to give a signal to Tony Marshall that's it, we're not doing any more changes. 
When asked on the stand why he wrote final codicil, he wouldn't be able to admit it. He said he had no, he had no memory of why he used those words. He had no business doing it and he disserved Brooke Astor, his client, and Sullivan and Cromwell in doing so. Now here's the day that she gives up the 60 million that was meant for charity and gives it to her son. 12 o'clock that day, she's in front of Dr. Pritchett and she says, I'm Gaga, thinking NG, but when engaged in conversation, she's pretty alert. If you're describing yourself as Gaga on the day that you're giving 60 million, then I think it's crazy to give away that money to, chair, uh, to Tony when she wanted her entire life to give it to charity. And here is the way the notes are described when they do the codicil at her house. Visitors and heir came and had a closed door meeting with her, seemed distant and uncertain after they left, wanted to go downstairs, was assured she is at 778. She wasn't even sure where she was. Now you look at the questions that had to be asked of her and you ask, at that point, would she know the words? By this codicil, do you wish to make your son the sole executor of your estate? You know, she has word search problems. She's forgetting words. Are you also passing your assets outright to your son instead of in trust? And do you wish the two of us to witness this document and sign the affidavit attached? That's the question she was asked. And this is the nurse's diary, the killer diary. Golden boy is Tony. The tutor is the lawyer, Morrissey. Took Princess Pollyanna, that's her code word for Mrs. Astor. One on each arm, pulling her into the library. Shortly after, two men arrived. Mrs. Astor didn't even know if she was coming and going. She didn't want to be pushed into any business. And she said, do you hear me? She banged her stick on the floor. And her son came to escort her. And then Frank Morrissey came through the front door. She was wild-eyed. She said, who is that? She doesn't know Morrissey is a lawyer. I can't walk my legs and the legs automatically produce Parkinson's syndrome. That's the physical and mental state she was in when they took this money from her. And then Morrissey tries to justify it by doing this memo to file afterwards in which he says, he claims that Mrs. Astor, he had a nice conversation with her that day and he said, uh, she talked about 9-11. How do you think things are going? I knew intuitively she was referring to world events. I said I thought it was the most dangerous moment in history. She said, yes, it's a religious war. She likened it to the feeling she had in China during the Boxer Rebellion. The problem was Morrissey should have done better research. Mrs. Astor was not alive during the Boxer Rebellion. Also, at the end of this memo, it says that Mrs. Astor was interested in the price where the price of gold was going. She could barely talk and barely move. She wasn't talking about the price of gold. They also, Tony Marshall does a party for himself in which they write this thing, which is supposedly in Brooks' words about how wonderful he was as a son. It was all nonsensical, drafted by Tony and Charlene to make it justify the looting of the estate. I am grateful to him for he's achieved managing my affairs. He's done a magnificent job. Every person was told the contrary. And here, Terry Christensen ends up getting fired and Morrissey brings in another lawyer to execute these changes. And Christensen goes there in February and Christensen says to Tony Marshall that she was incompetent, which was clearly true. And it was true when he did the change as well. There's no business in changing it. Here it was, the two sides of Marshall. He stopped spending on Brooke Astor because this was money that was going to him. He wouldn't pay $2,000 for a safety gate at the duplex at 778 because there was a fear that she'd fall down the stairs. He was not a following pledges to charity. He wouldn't clean the rugs for her. He wouldn't get her flowers but he was giving himself $920,000 yachts. He was giving charity to charities of his own, to his own theater productions. He was basically stealing money that belonged to her because she was too out of it to be able to say no, and there was no lawyer watching it. And here was the offensive thing. The lawyer who came in at a point where Brooke Astor 
was alive, he does a calculation to see how much Tony's going to take. And you see it says date of death, 2-7-2006. He does this calculation of estate tax at a point where she was alive. So they're putting a date of death on a, a mark, mock up tax return at the time that she's alive. It's like a criminal going back to somebody's house with the loot and counting how much they had. The lawyer who came in and did this change had never met Brooke Astor before he showed up. He met with her for 15 minutes. And as our expert said, the function of a lawyer isn't a scrivener. He's not a draftsman sitting in a room writing documents. He needs loyalty to the client. You can't simply write a will for somebody you've never met. How would you know what to put in it? How would you know what they want? And that's what Morrissey had a lawyer do to change everything and to steal from the estate. This is just a little uh, headline from this. I, I got a little emotional at one point and had a bitter exchange with a lawyer. And that's how I was known as I'll kick your aster. It's really very uh, telling. So they go to trial, the jury was out 18 days, and uh, this is just a little amusing cartoon as to whether or not Tony thought the jail was good or bad. Tony went to jail for four months and was released. He got a sentence of one and a half to four and a half. The lawyer did two years in jail. Uh, there, was, there was a settlement of a will contest in Westchester and the charities got much of the money. Here is the Astor case by the numbers. Age of combined defendants, 151, 85, and uh, I guess what's the math, 66. Weeks the trial expected to last, eight to 10. Actual weeks, 21, 88 court days. Jurors attacked while commuting from court one. Seat cushions bought by Charlene Marshall to court five. You see the trial transcript of 17,000, one Nobel Prize winner, one Emmy winner. Now let's do the more important numbers, Joel's numbers. Bottles of Tums, four. Trips to doctor with chest pains, one, thankfully. Haircuts, four. Days for summation. I summed up for two and a half days. Seasons on trial, three. The little people who ended up convicting these two, numerous short prosecutors, one. Now this is the thing that you should know. This is something that was written by Brooke Astor in Vanity Fair and oh my Lord, how prophetic. My grandmother used to say when I was in my teens and ravenous, Brooke, you must never eat everything on your plate. It is not ladylike. A real lady should always leave something on her plate. I'm looking back, I recognize a philosophy behind this admonition. To want to enjoy one's dinner is correct, but greed is not. Hunger can be satisfied, but greed never can. That poem was in evidence, and in my summation I said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, after 88 days of trial, who does that sound like it is describing? And this is basically me actually from the trial, uh, and I would be delighted now to stop, share, and to answer any questions you have. It's been Jewish difficult. Privilege. Sorry it went so long. To try to summarize it, there's an aspect that one of the was charged against the lawyer for forging the third Brooks Astor's signature on the third codicil. I couldn't even get into that. It's very difficult to, 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 to summarize basically 17,000 pages. I have tried to do it justice. So I'd love to be able to entertain your questions now about anything about the case or anything about the work in the DA's office.